And uh, we're going to have really fun two hours looking at the frontier of uh, AI and design. And um, I have a couple of words uh, for uh, housekeeping during the talks. Um, and uh, first, uh, though, I, I want to introduce you to the agenda. So I'm going to give an introduction to the uh, field. Uh, I'm going to view uh, a review um, the frontier of AI uh, infused tools in, in design. Um, give you a lot of um, uh, insights into how we're using AI these days and what kind of research developments are going on across uh, the different aspects and different challenges that we have in design. Uh, these examples come from uh, Adobe and Google and Tencent and all these companies that you know. Uh, after that, we're going to have uh, Lasse Likkan and he's going to talk about data-driven design practice in the Finnish IT industry. And he has he's very uh, privileged, uh, he has a very privileged position to talk about that because he's been leading the data-driven design day for many years now and has a, has a really good uh, site to the whole, whole area. Then we have uh, Maria Elisa Sikonen, uh, who's going to talk about elevator design process based on simulated people flow. This is something that they have been doing uh, among others at Kone. Uh, for many, many years, uh, and it's a, it's a role model for the use of simulation models for, uh, in the industry. And then we have, uh, as the last speaker, but definitely not the least, we have the machine learning lead from Supercell, uh, who's going to talk about game AI and, and how that's built at uh, Supercell for Clash Royale. And um, these talks are about 15 minutes each, and we're going to have uh, Q&A session at the end of each, um, each talk. And there's going to be a um, uh, tool for that. You should see that in the panel in uh, Zoom, it's called Q&A. So let's not use the chat tool, but the Q&A tool. And I'm going to moderate the discussion. Um, and you know, let's see how many, how many questions we have time to actually answer. But then also at the end of the, the whole webinar, we're going to have time for, for discussion. Um, I also want to remind that we're going to be recording this event. Hopefully, that's fine. And uh, but that doesn't mean that the discussions are are recorded. We're going to record the, the talks themselves. If you're interested in following us, uh, you find the Twitter handles here. Okay. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, start with the sitting the scene talk uh, on. AI meets design again. So I, I took the liberty of changing my title a little bit because I want to show how this field has been progressing the last, uh, let's say 10 years and what we're meeting uh, right now. So I just want to remind that in many areas of design, especially engineering design, we have already been using physics-based computer-aided design tools. Uh, for example, for the design of civil structures, uh, civil engineering or uh, structural design and, and so on, using things like fluid dynamic modeling or mechanics modeling and so on. The question that we're asking today is that how can we, how can we reach uh, from that space and um, uh, talk about AI-assisted design in the area of interaction design, user interface design, service design, UX design, where the common denominator is that um, either the designer or the end user uh, uh, is, is taken seriously uh, from the perspective of, of human factors. Uh, that, you know, from algorithmic perspective, if you're dealing with uh, um, you know, end users or, or designers, uh, you must take into account in those algorithms uh, questions like, well, how would you represent certain basic aspects of what people want, uh, what their capabilities are, what their situations are, and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a slight uh, or actually quite radical reframing uh, going from uh, physics-based applied engineering into consumer product design uh, that, that we need to, need to take. So with that, um, I want to also um, take you to the uh, world of a regular interaction designer. Uh, by and large, most of them, uh, with the exception of maybe visualization and data analysis tools, they don't use a lot of AI-infused tools in their practice. Rather, much of the critical phases like generating ideas, um, you know, making sense of data, uh, writing prototypes and, and, you know, testing designs, you know, it's done manually. And it's not very efficient way of working and it's, it's very much uh, influenced by the personal capabilities of the designer and the, and the uh, practices of the design team. Uh, but uh, every investment into this domain 
uh, is is paying itself back. Uh, there are some pretty staggering numbers on the um, return of investment and also on the importance of uh, design in uh, producing innovations that are the basis of, of economic growth and renewal of, of uh, innovation. So with that uh, in mind, and that as our, our, our goal, we want to visit uh, some of the modern techniques, but you know, you, you, in AI, and you might be asking, well, I mean, don't we already have some pretty cool uh, AI techniques there? Like, and if you go to PowerPoint, uh, it's going to give you some design suggestions uh, like the one on the, the on the on the right that you see there. Uh, well, uh, it turns out that that's um, one of the earliest forms of AI methods uh, called rule-based systems. And you have um, something on the canvas. You have rules inside of the computer that tells, well, how would you map a title? How would you map um, a subtitle and so on into another uh, template? So you have a, a system of rules and templates, and this system has uh, all the downsides of um, all rule-based approaches in AI. So they are they're brittle, they are difficult to grow. If something changes, then you must redesign the rule system and so on and so forth. So they work as long as you have well understood domain that is relatively small and immutable. If any of those uh, assumptions are violated, then, then you better uh, do something else. So this is sort of the state of the art together with some optimization methods until 1990s and uh, when we started to have new methods. And right now we're looking at um, some um, models and methods that you may have heard of, uh, simulation intelligence, model-based methods, of course, deep learning, reinforcement learning, and mo most recently, some of the very large, uh, some, some of the most exciting developments have come from uh, large language models and foundation models. Now I'm going to talk about some of those uh, methods in, in the review that I'm going to show. And um, you know, I'm going to talk about roughly how they work and what would be the benefit for designers. And the ethos or the motto for today is that uh, when we're developing artificial general intelligence, uh, we're, we're developing uh, AI that would be empowering the designer. The idea is that we're not replacing designers, but we're making a more powerful designer who will use AI and might replace those designers who don't. And this is a, an adaptation from the domain of, of medicine where they had a similar discussion earlier. Okay, um, so I'm going to introduce you to the frontier of AI-based methods in design. And just to give you an overview before going into, into the details, um, if you think about the design thinking double diamond model of uh, design and innovation, um, by and large, most of the examples that I'm going to show are occur occurring on the right-hand side. So we're talking about generating ideas, prototyping, you know, testing and evaluating, but there's much less on the left-hand side. So this gives you an idea of where we are in terms of those methods at the moment. Um, but I picked uh, a, a quite a number of them. I think we have uh, nine or 10 of them. And I'm going to introduce and go through these uh, examples. I'm going to start with one of my favorites. This is a topic I was teaching actually this morning uh, to my students, which is the use of saliency models. So these are models that are predicting where users will look at when they see your game display, graphical UI, poster, infographics, whatever. And these kind of heat maps can be produced by deep learning algorithms that are trained on uh, human eye tracking data. And they, they do that magnificently well. It's remarkable how good they are these days. Uh, even with inter interfaces that they had not seen uh, in the training data, they can perform really well. Now, you know, doing this kind of analysis, um, you know, with the eye tracker, you know, would take a lot of time and it's expensive. So this is definitely something that designers, I believe, uh, will and are actually shifting to use. At Adobe Research, they've been pioneering salience in models. And one of the applications of that is uh, to, to help designers relay out layouts in a way that then you can uh, have controllably more attention to a particular element that you want uh, the user to be attending. For example, you can pick uh, the face and you can ask the algorithm to make that uh, more salient and, and you, can, you can nicely uh, see the results here. Okay, so that's, that's application area number one that I think is, is pretty interesting. Now, another use of deep learning uh, is um, illustrated by this uh, uh, the screenshot that is uh, showing work from Tencent in China, 
uh, what they do is they have been training algorithms that are able to detect the omission or lacking of elements or some, some misuse of elements uh, on, the, on the UI. For example, uh, there are some elements here that are overlapping. There's a button missing over here. There's a logo missing over here. There's some uh, uh, truncated text over here. And what you can do is you can then highlight them uh, to the designer. As I show later, you can actually do more than, more than highlight issues. You can actually also fix them for the designer. But you can imagine that uh, complex UIs, they have so many moving parts and it's really valuable that uh, so, so much complexity and so many different guidelines. It's really valuable if we can have algorithms that can you know, do some of the uh, spotting of such violations uh, automatically for us. The third uh, case is about uh, aesthetics, which is always important in design. And uh, one of the breakthrough algorithms was uh, by Google, it's called NEMA. And they first trained it with natural images, basically uh, predicting uh, how beautiful uh, a person would perceive an, uh, an image to be. And uh, the results are pretty good. I'm pretty good, uh, sure that they are better than, than what the human might do in predicting other humans' uh, aesthetic ratings. And now there's work on adapting these to uh, graphical interfaces as well. So in the future, you will be going to have um, evaluative support where these algorithms are making predictions that, okay, uh, well, this is how beautiful your, your page will be for maybe for this uh, group of users or this culture. Another uh, application area is still using deep learning uh, to, 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 to recognize and, and segment uh, uh, elements from an image in, in such a way that then uh, you can put, uh, automatically translate them in, into code. Normally you use a lot of time in, in sketching, a lot of time in prototyping, a lot of time in trying out these prototypes. And now we can sort of bridge these separate uh, phases of design with tools like this. These are already available for, for designers to try. Uh, another use is concerning information retrieval. Uh, this is something that Google has been working on uh, since last, uh, at least uh, 10 years. Uh, they've been uh, calling that design mining. So as opposed to a textual query, you can put in a, a layout query and you can get uh, uh, information or, or retrieval results related to um, UIs that are matching that, that query partially or fully. And you can imagine that there's, there's uh, thousands of pages or thousands of designs that are out there. They're in a way an, an asset if you can access them. Uh, they can serve as um, you know, uh, seeds for inspiration. Uh, they can give you direct solutions to your problem. But just, you know, how do you find them? Regular search engines are not made for that. So that's another application of AI that I think is really, really valuable. Now, reinforcement learning is a relatively new kid in the block. And while, while how we're using that is we're using that to simulate how users behave and especially how they adapt their behavior when a design is adapted. The one on the left is, is done up by our group and it simulates how people solve uh, or basically type text given a, a, an interface. Whereas the one on the right, uh, this shows um, work by my colleague Perko Hamalainen. He's been working on this kind of uh, human-like puppets that can climb and he's uh, uh, using them to, to optimize uh, playgrounds for kids. You know, you, can, you, you want to have just the right level of uh, challenge uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, the safety, right? So that they, they should not be too, too challenging, but not too easy, and definitely they should not be unsafe. So with this kind of methods, you can then computationally generate possible playgrounds or possible interfaces. And then uh, as opposed to going to the lab and asking people to test them, you can then ask from these user simulators, well, how long would it take for me to solve this problem? How much, uh, how, what's the probability of failing or error? Uh, what are the muscle efforts that are involved and, and so on? So this is another big area of, of uh, advances right now. Moving forward, uh, we're also increasingly using not only saliency models, but also other models of human perception to optimize visual displays. Uh, for example, the one on the left is optimized to, to what you see on the right uh, using some models of human perception. This uh, in, uh, originated in computer graphics and is called perceptual optimization. And you can think about having uh, you know, complex displays or complex data visualizations that, that will be then optimized for the human perception to get the most out of that uh, the display, uh, you know, most in terms of information, but also sort of perceiving the inherent structure in your data set. 
Uh, right now, they've been using uh, combinatorial optimization and then some uh, sequence to sequence learning, for example. Uh, we, in our group, we've been using a lot model based optimization. And uh, one direction there uh, has been to incorporate um, very rich models of human behavior in, in simpler versions such that they can be used in a, a very large design problems like how to, how to design a keyboard layout. Uh, which are among some of the, the hardest design problems that, that I know of uh, among layout problems. And to concretize this direction of advances, then we've been able to now formulate more human-related design objectives into these optimizers. For example, uh, objectives related to human performance and ergonomics and familiarity and intuitiveness. And uh, we worked with the French government recently and we helped them to redesign their, their keyboard standard and this is how it looks like. And it came out in 2019. And according to my knowledge, it's the first uh, computer assisted design of a keyboard layout uh, in the world, uh, standard at least. Uh, moving on, um, it's increasingly important that uh, these AI assisted tools are incorporated into design systems. And this seems to be a direction that Google has noticed, for example. Uh, design systems are combinations of design philosophy, design guidelines, but in an actionable way where you can, for example, directly use com software components uh, that then act uh, in a user interface. And what they've been realizing is that you need to incorporate any AI support into these design, design systems and therefore also uh, design tools. For example, they've been working on how do you integrate AI assisted coloring uh, into, into Figma, a design tool that, uh, that is very popular right now. Um, this is uh, one of the last uh, examples that I'm going to use, uh, but this is about experimental research. Often when you develop a uh, design, you have lots of design possibilities, lots of open parameters, and re it's really expensive to test them in a the lab, right? Because for every condition you need, uh, you know, maybe 10 uh, users and, and, you know, running one user in one condition, it takes about 15 minutes to one hour at least. Um, and what we have been doing is we've been uh, using Bayesian optimization, which is a method for optimal experiment design to help us pick which condition to show next. So what it does, it looks at the observation so far and tries to optimally pick the next condition. Basically it tries to avoid uh, conditions that probably are going to be bad and try to focus it on uh, potential uh, conditions. And, and we've been showing that in some cases, there are like uh, 10 times, 10 fold savings in efficiency over regular A-B testing. Um, finally, uh, I've been really impressed by uh, the improvements in Photoshop. Uh, they've been offering some um, AI infused tools directly to the end user, making, allowing them to almost work at the level of paid designers. For example, uh, you can have a neural filter that uh, changes the age of a person uh, in real time. It's just, you know, uh, a drag and drop of slider and it's going to make the changes for you. Really impressive. And this is another direction that I think is interesting, giving designer-like capabilities to end users. So, so in, in a way, bypassing the designers and developers and, and directly working with the end users. With that, um, I just want to mention some work that we have going on at uh, Alt University, um, we have some of the members of this project called design.ai, which is Business Finland uh, developed, uh, funded project, uh, where we, um, among others, uh, doing uh, evaluation of interfaces uh, with fixing. So we evaluate, for example, what are the guideline violations that you have? What are the saliences that you have? And we always show before and after fixes. You can see the, the interface being, being changed here. And we're integrating all of this into, into Figma. So right now we're moving on with, with the first uh, demos. And if you're interested, you can email me. Uh, I'm going to join you to the email list. With that, um, computation superpowers are here. They are not replacing uh, designers. They are rather small tools that are sprinkled around the design process that help us be, help us be, uh, be more productive and, and smarter and innovative, and of course, offer value uh, to the end users.